So there's a lot to read these days about how to keep it together in these tough times. I'm sure you've been reading it as I have. Um, often it's about like a pedicure or something like that. Um, and don't think you're excluded if you're a man. Um, and somehow that's gonna be one of the things or maybe something that would help you keep proper perspective in your mind in this time. And maybe help you to go on in the world open-hearted, um, maybe with just exactly the right amount of stoic and confident and successful and serving and loving and challenging and truth-telling that we know God or someone has made us to be, all of it, right? So the latest thing I've read about it is about that is called an awe walk, which is a mouthful of a word for a sermon. Awe, spelled A-W-E, like the awe and wonder in God's works that we will pray upon the newly baptized today. In this moment, as a quality awesome enough to be invoked as a gift of the Spirit, an awe walk is accomplished by something like me telling you to go and walk somewhere a little bit new. It could be on this campus, right here, across the grass, in a direction that you have not taken recently, or maybe over the downtown corridor, but looking out for the flowers along the way, or under the shade trees in the park, but maybe looking in a slightly different direction. Something just new enough to cause you to pay attention. Look for the details, is what you're supposed to do. Try to look at things askance or afresh. You can do it right here in this room or on the Zoom screen that you're watching this on. You can do it just with your eyes. You can look up and over and walk your eyes across the play of light on the glass in this room. The detail of the wood above you or at your hands. You could run your fingers on the bench close to you, or if you are lucky enough to have a hand next to you to touch, you could reach over and notice it under your fingers, only if you know them, but you know. <laughs> An awe walk, the neurologists are telling us. Awe is partly about focusing on the world outside of your head and rediscovering that it is filled with marvelous things that are not you. That simply, the marvelous things that are not you, that, that, somehow seems to settle the mind. It puts us in our right place in the universe of things, as Mary Oliver names the world, and we know this deep in our bones, in our prayers. We know it enough to pray for our babies. Let us cultivate it within ourselves, the marvelous things that are not me. So what is God like might be the ultimate question of the not me, me universe. And it is the question awe invites us to stand in the presence of. A year ago on Transfiguration on this Sunday last year, when I stood here as a stranger for the first time or down there, I was wondering about what this church was like, who you were. You might have been wondering what I thought church was like and what it was for. The image that stayed with me as I wondered how to prepare for this first day last year was of a torch, a flashlight swung back and forth like an old oil lantern on a chain, like a thurible or like candles, lighting the long way with a wide arc, lighting far ahead and behind, forcing our heads up to understand where we are going, not too close, worrying about each small step, but rather a challenge for we who do not see very well in the dark, and yet what is required for the confidence to go forward. The church, this church, is like that. Our bishops at the Lambeth Conference have been thinking about what the church is for, hearing from one another that the church is so different throughout the world and even within our own church in this country, that it is almost unrecognizable in its concerns across the greater communion. So into that vast body of difference, dressed to look alike, right? The Bishop of Newark in New Jersey quoted the Archbishop of Canterbury as saying this of the church near the end. We are revolutionaries, the Archbishop of Canterbury said. 
The Christian revolution must be one of mercy and forgiveness, generosity and engagement. Revolution should be part of the institutional life of those who proclaim Christ. Revolution should be part of the institutional life of those who proclaim Christ. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. A regular pedicure is so much more possible, right? <laughs> I don't know what a revolution means in institutional life. I'm not sure those words could, can or should really go together, but maybe it means what the Bishop of Lesotho said at the opening Eucharist of that conference. Our communion could heal the world if we chose. I believe that, and that is why I'm here. I want to be with people who can believe like that, who can lift our eyes from watching for the pebbles and the debris at our feet or the painful past, and with that, follow the wide arc of light cast before us towards unknown futures and swing back that same light, that small light that is ours to hold, our only light, confidently for those behind who have need of it. I want to live like that, and I want that for you. So what is God like, the Bible seems to ask over and over. We often respond with what the church is like, as I have done. What is God like, the readings ask us today. God is like Moses, the people of Israel say, one of us, greater than us, staying with us, a wild and troubled man who heard the voice of God clearly, heard God in the flames, could draw the power of life with a staff and his anger, compelled God to make food fall from the sky, and in his exhaustion cries out to see God, to know more of God near the end of his life, after a lifetime of conversation with God. That was literally the whole entire revolution for those people. He walked his people peacefully out of the land of their slavery into the land of promise. The Bible says the land of promise. Too much beauty for one lifetime. And so to satisfy Moses' question in that exquisite verse of Exodus 33:22, right before the passage we have, Moses, it says, is tucked into the crevice of the mountain, covered with God's hand, it says, so that God may pass by and grant Moses his wish, the one that he cannot bear, to see God, which is today's reading. The awe is so great, the power is so great that it says Moses' face shines. And in the Hebrew, I understand that it shines horribly, awfully, awe-filled, in some way that the people cannot bear it. But if they need proof that God is with Moses, his unbearable face now declares it. And the gospel readings place Jesus in that fine lineage today. Except that Jesus is so fully God that God's beloved Jesus just glows, it says, filled with light, does not change or become unbearable, is the inheritor of Moses and Elijah, the desire of the people and the glory of God wrapped into one, most fully himself revealed in glorious light today. And it is good for us to be here. It is good. Let us not forget the great vision cast for us, for the world, for the church, for these children to be baptized, cast for you at your baptism, cupped in the hand of God, washed in these waters for the healing of the world. In an article about the elections in Kansas last week, a writer from Kansas wrote of a kind of cedar tree that is planted in the plains a little too close together. She um, describes a century-old series of them on her family's farm. Cedar trees intentionally planted a little bit too close so that as they grow, their branches will grow together, intertwined as a perimeter barrier for small farms like her family's farm, a barrier from the harsh winds that blow across those bare plains, interlocked as they grow, kind of like the ceiling in this church, seeking their own individual flourishing in that harsh sun and soil, protecting that little path, patch upon which a little family has staked their entire future. 
Now, everything about that story is complicated. How they got there, what was there before, who was there before, why the wind blows as it does on the plains, whose plains. Yes, it is very complicated. But I am struck by the image of those trees. She calls them shelter belts, a shelter belt. Like the wood frame of the ceiling above your head, reflected in the lines you can run your fingers over where you are sitting, or your eyes on the screen, like the play of light in glass, the bones of your companion's hand. A shelter, the revolution in the institution, the long arc of sure light, you and I together, seeking to know what God is like for the healing of the world. <laughs> 